Good evening, family. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the mental house. I am your host, Khadija. Uh, welcome to this third day of Kwanzaa. And um, I just wanted to, I wanted to bring some information to y'all, family, that we talk about all the time here. Um. And I think it's very important because a psychologist explains how a nationwide breakdown of empathy has created to today's toxic environment. And um, which is something I totally agree with, especially in the GOP. Um, the toxicity that is going on, the fact that Donald Trump has uh, won the presidency, um, it's got people turning up on violence uh, against black people. Um, just the whole um, madness that we're experiencing right now, the toxicity that we're experiencing right now. Again, nobody is going to convince me that I, this nation is just a nation that is circling the drain. And I don't, I can't stress that enough. Y'all don't remember history. Those who don't remember history, those who don't remember the past are condemned and repeated. Of all our studies, Malcolm said, and I think it was Elijah Muhammad said, history is best reward, is, is the best uh, gauge to reward our research. History. Because if you don't know how you got here and you're not thinking about how you got here, it's like, it's doomsday for you. First of all, Nobody addressed the, the psychosis of how the country was built in the first place. And we've had ample opportunities. We've had uh, the time, the period during the end of slavery to address it, uh, Reconstruction, the Jim Crow. We could have addressed all these things that the community at large was just hell-bent on keeping black and brown, especially, no, specifically black bodies, as the scapegoats. And so once you've created, and the, and the Native American, of course, because he's just relegated to his own little space. And how dare me see you come <laughs> from where you are. I mean, when's the last time you walked down the street and actually saw uh, Native Americans? Okay? You don't see them. Because white people have relegated them to a certain place, and that's where they are. So that's the psychosis that's going on here. Now, I just liken it to I, I liken this whole race situation to a cup of coffee. You know, and I know a lot of you might get angry with this analogy, but oh well, we've been angry before. So let me say this and still be loved. Um, I, I like it, liken it to a cup of coffee. When you first get the coffee, it's black. That's the original man. The more you pour cream, you can pour a little cream and it. it'll just turn light a little bit. But the more you dump milk and milk and milk and milk and milk into this coffee, it ceases to be in, in tasting like that black coffee that you initially had. In fact, it's still a derivative of coffee, but it's not the same. In fact, you got more milk in it now. And it just totally uh, uh, it just obliterates the taste, in my opinion. Now, some people like their coffee like that. But it's a hybrid of the original. I'm sure you all would agree with me. So, if I look at, um, in terms of your own scientists, which is European scientists, they say that white folks have Neanderthal and they have recessed monkey in their DNA. There is no sign of that in African people. So all that mixing, mixing, mixing um, is probably with Neanderthal. So that's what makes you able to... Um, you know, absorb killing so well. And I'm not saying this, and I'm not trying to be a, you know, a scientist here or be racist or mean right now. I'm just trying to lay out a fact as I lay out some some concepts that have, um, and facts, really. Because Lyndall and Leakey and all these guys are scientists and these, 
they, they contend that life originated in Africa, and I'm sure most of you would agree with that at this point. And if you're wondering where I'm going with this, because y'all know I like to go all over and bring it back in. I'm bringing it back in because as black people, we have to be aware of what we're dealing with. And everybody, anybody with common sense knows that when white people have a cold, black people have AIDS. So if white folks are behaving crazy, then you can imagine how black folks are. They just, they just extremely, totally out of control. I mean, we can't even get it right in our own communities, but yet still we want, uh, you know, we want to be looked at like, these things are not happening in our community. These things are not happening that we can't seem to control and do anything about. Oh, but we won't. Don't disrespect me. I mean, it, there's just so much madness on the planet, and it's so toxic, so much toxic behavior that it just it goes right back to the crazy families. You got the crazy white families that sat there and took their kids and let allowed them to watch black people being burnt. Um and mutilated and castrated. They took their children to watch these things. Um, black people not only experienced the pain of that and, and, and the constant, constant, constant reminder that you're not good enough and you're black, stay back, and that we've developed a hatred for ourselves. So even in the communities that are supposed to be positive and uplifting black people, they even fight. They're fighting their own selves. They're... Uh, bringing guns and to the fights and and these are people that are supposed to be conscious so I, my point is the whole country is toxic okay so i want to share this article with you and i'm i'm not going no further than your family because your family's crazy if we can't start there, we can't start nowhere. I don't care about the black shit. I don't care about the white shit. I don't care about nothing. But you got crazy white people who got crazy families who have passed on the pain body of watching black bodies being mutilated. That's craziness. And it's passed down. And you have this mixed with the De Neanderthal or DNA. And the recess monkey, you got a lot of shit going on with this group of people. Then you got these other ones over here who have witnessed all this trauma, who had to endure a middle passage, who had to endure slavery, Jim Crow, and all the diabolical incest that had to go on between us and all that shit. We've never had any psychological help for this. So we got to deal with this shit. And then we're running around here procreating with each other. And God knows uh, what else it, it, besides us penetrating each other with our own milk, who knows what else is going on and mixed with their milk, okay? So we're all mixed up anyway. That's the crazy part about the whole thing. Now, with that being said, how do we get to the point where a conspiracy spouting birther could win the presidency by appealing to people's primal rage? How does that happen? Okay, well, psychologist Michael Bader writes in Psychology Today, Today that a paper published all the way back in 1978 by developed psychologist Edward Tronick may offer some disturbing clues. Tronick's paper, which was published in the Journal of the American Academy of Child Psychiatry, examines the importance of early interaction between a mother and her baby. In particular, the paper cites a study showing that mothers can instill cases of extreme anxiety and distress in their infants if they responded to them by keeping their faces perfectly still and expressionless. What does this have to do with contemporary American politics, you may ask? Well, Bader believes that modern society serves us poorly when, when it comes to us giving uh, you as a um, when it comes to, excuse me, giving us regular empathetic feedback, which in turn makes us feel equal parts angry and helpless. Okay, both of them occupy the same space, helpless and angry. The steel face paradigm, the helplessness intrinsic, intrinsic to it and the breakdown of empathy is what lies at its foundation. 
Um, when you describe the experience of many people as they interact with the most important institutions in their lives, including government, you would think that you would have some feedback. <laughs> and as with Tony's babies and their mothers, when our social melu is indifferent to our needs and inattentive to our suffering, widespread damage is done to our psychics, causing distress, anger, and helplessness. Now we just turn it on everybody. We just like sharks now. It doesn't matter. It defeats just blood and frenzy. You know, it's it's just it's distress, anger, and, and just hopelessness. A Bader also says that several regular regular occurrences in modern life have contributed to a nationwide breakdown of empathy. That leaves us feeling helpless and alone. Among other things, he cites students being forced into large sized classes where they get little personal attention. Long and stressful commutes that have no meaningful human interaction and waiting for hours on the phone for technical support. This pain is increasingly prevalent among working and middle class Americans who have seen their jobs lost to technology and globalization. Their incomes are stagnant and the promise of a better life for their children appear increasingly unlikely. Their interactions with their doctors, pharmacists, bankers, landlords, state and federal tax collectors, social service agency, auto dealers, cable providers are too often marked by frustration and feelings of dehumanization. And for black folk, you need to put in the very people that we pay taxes to to uh, protect us, which is our law enforcement. Um, they have also become a pariah in our community. They they rule it like occupied force and they kill us it's just that simple um now from this perspective bader thinks that the rise of a donald trump makes perfect sense even though its end result is the stoking of a toxic tribalism that sets america against one another you know i keep thinking how i keep reflecting at high on high park and how when Obama initially got together, you saw a sea of people, but they were loving each other. It was all different colors of humanity. And that that picture stays in my mind because to me, that that, that I saw a glimpse of a glimpse of heaven that day in my mind. I don't know about nobody else, I'm just speaking for myself. I saw all colors, I saw all races, and the people were happy. They weren't at this um winning speech or uh, um, they wasn't at this platform watching him because they were disgusted at his uh, presidency. You saw black people hugging white people. You saw Chinese people hugging black people. You saw a sea of humanity. Wow. And I'll, I'll never forget that because that was an illusion. But it was also what the kingdom of heaven looks like. And so for those of y'all who are not very religious, I'm not but we, we were made into tribes and families that we may get to know one another. Not to antagonize and kill one another. That's why we're made into different groups and tribes. So we can get to know one another. Not to just totally unseparate from each other. Remember, race is a construct. Somebody thought of this. I'm going to be mean to you because of the color of your skin. It wasn't the way it was. But it's the way it is now. It's, it's what is uh, Peter Holmes be saying? That's just the way it is. Da -da -da -da. All right. I digress. Let me go back. Anyway, this toxic tribalism is what set is what set in America one against the other, and so it's been happening now. It's just a turn up. Donald Trump clearly spoke to this pain, he writes. He empathized with the traumatic losses and helplessness of the white middle class and working class. He helped them feel part of something bigger than themselves, a movement which combated their isolation. And this movement was wrapped in propaganda, wrapped in racism, 
of sending Mexicans back. Um, I mean, it was just wrapped in all kinds of stuff that you saw that was really underneath the surface of most of these white people that they had to suppress for eight years, in my opinion. And when Obama went off to the left, uh, because I don't know too many black people that were happy with Obama's presidency, quite to the contrary, what a lot of you well, white supremacists think. A lot of us are so glad that he's gone because you've taken out what you feel about black people <laughs> because he was in the White House. Y'all took all that hostility. I'm taking all that hostility out on us right now. But you fail to remember, we didn't get reparations or anything like that up under Obama's watch. We didn't get anything up under his watch that remotely make him think, make anybody think that he was a black man looking out for black people and their interests. He wouldn't even look at H.R. 40. Is that what it is? Where they talk about the reparations like the same ones you give Jewish people and the same ones that um, uh, uh, gay people, you might as well say they had reparations when you can, uh, gay marriages, okay. And, and, I, and I don't have anything against this, this now, right? Wait a minute, let's get this straight. My point is, I'm not making a call one way or the other. My call is the fact that you didn't even touch anything that had to do with the robbery and the rape and the thievery of African Americans. And this is why we're in this condition that we're in right now. Because y'all stole all our money. Stole all our wealth. Okay? That's my concern. Okay? And that's the only problem I got with this government. The only problem. I don't care about white people. They don't affect... I mean, I'm not thinking about them like that. Okay? And I suggest that most black people don't think about them like that. I, I suggest that you get ready and get together for an agenda to bring to this government about our money. Now, that's what people don't want to hear. But anyway, I don't want to go and regress anymore. I don't want to digress. So let me go back. Um, anyway, this, this, um, this trick in 78 when the psychologist uh, Edward Tronick and his colleagues uh, published that paper in the journal. I loved it because when they, when the mother was instructed to suddenly make her face in, uh, flat and completely still, in other words, and to do so for three minutes, regardless of the baby's activities, the mothers were then told to resume normal play. The design came to be called the still face paradigm. When mothers stopped their facial responses to their babies, and when the babies were still, the babies first anxiously strove to reconnect with their mothers. When the mother's faces remained neutral and still, the babies quickly showed even greater signs of confusion and distress, followed by a turning away from the mother, finally appearing sad and hopeless. When the mothers of the experiment were permitted to re-engage normally, their babies, after some initial protest, regained their positive, effective tone and resumed their relational uh, and imitative play playfulness. When a primary case caretaker the still face experiment were primarily done with mothers, not fathers. Fails to mirror the child's attempts to connect, the child becomes confused and distressed, protests, and then gives up. Um, and so it is really amazing how we are not looking at these studies uh, when it comes to the human family. We know, that's why I said all this information that's out here, the psychologists know, they know exactly what they've done to socially engineer people. Okay? White people are messed up because they've been fed a doctrine that they're better than people. And so now it's hard for, for them to get it right because they that's why they can't speak up for you even though they know it's wrong. They can't, they, they can't Dr. Jane Elliott, uh, she proved it. She asked them, do you think it's wrong? How many of you guys want to trade places? They were like, hell no. So they're complicit. And the thing about it is, when you've done all these studies and you know this is what's happening, and 
you can't even um, get the power that bees to engage in any kind of solution based um, you know any, any kind of anything that's solution based and you can't get them to agree some people just give up some people resort to a life of crime some people just kill themselves some people just you know zone out on drugs and alcohol self medicate okay but i'm going to finish this up and and because i want you guys to understand that this is what is happening on the other hand when an environment is um in a, when the environment is inattentive and not empathetic the child's stress response system embedded as it is in the architecture of the child's developing nervous system uh, mediators in this system include oxytocin opiate and dopamine receptors cortisol levels and parasympathetic nerve pathways these are all the things that are being activated in your brain overwhelm and may, many types of psychopathology result i hope you got that on the other hand when the environment is inattentive and not as empathetic the child's stress response systems embedded as it is in the architecture of the child's developing nervous system mediators in this system include oxytocin opiate dopamine receptors cortisol levels and parasympathetic nerve pathways they're overwhelmed and many types of psychopathologies result higher cognitive functions including language can suffer as the brain instinctively relies on a more prim primitive regions to deal with an unresponsive environment so just what i said if the environment is not responsive, then I might have to come a little bit more primitive. Worst scenarios are the ones occurring in conditions over which the children have no control, such as the dangers faced by the babies in the still face experiments. When are we powerless to prevent our nervous systems and psyches from being overwhelmed? Our physical, emotional, intellectual development is disrupted. And when this happens, we call this trauma. We've all been traumatized. All of us. As a metaphor for an adult life in a contemporary society, the steel face paradigm, the helplessness intrinsic to it, and the breakdown of empathy that lies at its foundation, aptly describes the experience of many people as they interact with the most important institution of their lives, including their own government. And, as with Tronics babies and their mothers, when our social milieu is indifferent to our needs and inattentive to our suffering, widespread damage is done to our psyches. And we have to understand that. This is causing distress again. And hopelessness. And we have no trust in others. So, lastly, I want to conclude this by saying, babies, citizens who look to corporations and government for help for a feeling of being recognized and important are too often on the fool's errand, seeking recognition and reciprocity that is largely absent. This problem is greatly exaggerated by the profoundly corrosive effects of social and economic inequalities. Under conditions of inequality, the vulnerability of those seeking empathy is dramatically ramped up, leading to various forms of physical and psychological breakdowns. In a classic epidemiological study by Richard Wilkerson, researchers found that a strong correlation between a degree of inequality in a country or state for that matter and such problems as rates 
of imprisonment, violence, teenage pregnancy, obesity rates, mental health problems such as anxiety, depression, and addictions, lower literacy scores, and a wide range of poor health outcomes, including reduced life expectancy, come under these conditions. Wow. Wilkinson is, uh, and Key's key finding is that it is the inequality itself, not the overall wealth of a society that is the key factor in creating these various pathologies. Poorer places with more equality do better than wealthy ones marked by gross inequality. Inequality makes it makes people feel insecure, preoccupied with their relative status and standing, and vulnerability and the vulnerable and vulnerable to judgment of others. And it creates a greater degree of social distance between people that deprives them of opportunities for intimate and healing experiences of recognition and empathy. D. But as still face <clears throat> as the still face experiments show, human beings are primed from birth to be social to seek out empathetic and attuned responses from others and to develop the psychobiological equipment to respond in kind. So when you're not having that, the pain is just, it's just too much. It's just too much. So um, lastly, I'm just going to make this last little paragraph because there's so much more to this. But the painful interaction of inequality and indifference is especially poignant and strongly felt as well by groups in our society who bear the brunt of discrimination. Black people, the LGBT community, immigrants are all especially traumatized by the still face of a society and the political invisibility and of the demeaning effects of prejudice and institutional biases. They are the most in need of empathy, yet are the least likely to get it. The rest of it needs no explanation. All right, if you like what you hear, please like and subscribe, okay? And share. And I'm going to see you a little later in the mental house. Thanks for being out there. Bye, family.